A walk with. Second part of a walk around the Golden Triangle in Douglas with Frank Cowan. So this sort of south side has, has it always been a sort of a, a, a working area as, as it is now in many ways? Well, it started to get developed. I mean, there was very little in the way of roadway along here at all. That was one of the things, and it was only to provide um, access to things like those that the roadway started and you really threw into the sort of 1790s before the roadway at the top end of, of the harbour really came to anything and the land there was developed. Um, that partly came out of a, an earlier bridge across the harbour because not so much of the development in places that have got rivers coming out to harbours ties up with bridges. But um, that was a bit further up but at this end opposite to us of course we had the market area which again is you know is all part of the, the sort of town centre and at the back edge of that really almost cornering onto the Douglas Hotel was the downtown church um, Old St Matthews and when all the redevelopment went on, of course, that was one of the buildings that was demolished, and we had the, the present building erected where it is now on the corner of Ridgeway Street and designed by one of the English Church Commissioner architects, John Loughborough Pearson, who also designed the new church at Braddon. And his big work course in England was, was Truro Cathedral. It's the one that he is, uh, as it were, famous best for. Best known for. <laughs> yes. yeah. So the new one dates from uh, when about? The, the late, late 1800s. Um, that's the sort of era that when he was operating, 1875 or 76, I think, in Bradley. And then this is a bit later. In fact, he, his son was involved in the completion works here. But the old St Matthews really was the heart of that golden triangle that we were talking about because so many of the people who lived down here were had their children christened there and so on. And one of those that did was Bly. Because okay, most people on the island know the story that Bly is was married a Duncan tends to disappear after that but in fact he lived down here in Douglas on the harbour side with his new wife and their first child was born here and was baptised in St Matthews so that was how come then you got the three main protagonists here with him with Peter Haywood or Peter Haywood's family and round the corner in Fort Street the Christian family the mother, the sister, the brother, or two brothers over a period of uh, Fletcher Christian living there. Uh, one of the brothers died there, the other died out on the Africa coast. So, um, and the mother and the sister both died there. And they're buried at, at Bratton, although unfortunately we don't know exactly where. Oh, seems rather a shame. Yes, there seems to be no, um, no grave marker or anything for them. We haven't yet managed to uh, to track them down exactly where they are. We know they're there, if not where, yes. as it were. <laughs> but it is incredible, as you say, to think of them all having lived here uh, within, well, like some stones throw at each yeah. other. Really. Having all the, the business with uh, Trafalgar and so on, um, at a period within the same time span, the, um, the Quilliam household decamped from where he was born in, in Moran up at Lower Balakelly and they were living down here 
and the youngest of, of John Quilliam's siblings was christened in um, St Matthew's. And so was the other Manx officer at um, Trafalgar. He was actually christened there himself. That was uh, Robert Benjamin Young, who was a sort of fellow lieutenant. He was the same substantive rank as Quilliam, but was it actually in charge of, of one of the, well, it was the smallest ship in the British fleet. Um, and he had been born here on the harbour side in Douglas. Oh. So there'd be a real maritime community, I suppose, based right the way around there, around the harbour. Oh, yes. And I think, you know, we, we've been hearing too about the sort of 68, 69 Manxmen. At least a third of those, probably more, were actually born in this bottom end of Douglas. So th there's a, a fair input. And then if you, you go back further in time, you've got people like um, Admiral Dundas, who was here as a captain, again on one of the small ships, um, in and out of Douglas. He had him, a house for himself out at what then was Strangford, the Strang yep. at Union Mills. <laughs> Um, but he moved from there because the house was damaged, so his daughter tells us in her biography, was damaged by an earthquake. And they moved to a house down here again in the Golden Triangle. <laughs> and he went on to, uh, to be a, an admiral. She went on to be one of the great female explorers of the 19th century and was involved, well, yeah, 19th century, and was involved with people like Lord Cochrane and, and others. She spent time out in India, she spent time in South America. Um, a great lady, and one that, that has largely skipped the record in the Isle of yeah. Man. <laughs> It is incredible how some people, like you say, some people are so well known and others uh, somehow or other seem to be bypassed by the history books. Well, I think it, she's not entirely bypassed by the history books because she married. Uh, it's very much under her married name that she was a recognised an explorer. She, became, she was Maria Dundas. She became Maria Graham. Um, and then she went, after her husband died, out in Chile. Um, after she came home, she married um, Lord Augustus, or Sir Augustus Colcott, the, the artist. And she was a good artist in her own right, and she did work for Q and all sorts of other things, but she also wrote a little um, children's history book, Arthur, Little Arthur's Britain, and, and um, that was... was sort of the Victorian bestseller for, for children's history. <laughs> so she was a remarkable lady. Talented lady. Yeah, but one who slipped the Manx record. Admittedly, she wasn't here for very long. And that's much the same, of course, we were saying about um, Robert Young, in a sense, senior to Quilliam. And yet it's only this year that it, it started, you know, to, to come to the fore that he was there at all because there was research being done on, yes, on yes. the captains at Trafalgar and his name popped up. Um, largely, I think, because after he'd been at sea and came ashore, he didn't come back to the island. Quilliam, of course, came back and was very much involved in Manx affairs and I think that's probably where the difference lies. And I'm fascinated by the little idea, that notion of the earthquake out at, uh, out at the Strang. Uh, yeah, that must have been a fairly rare occurrence, one would think. Well, no, in, apparently in the 1700s, the, the island had quite a few earthquakes. Um, Bishop Wilson's son, when he's writing about the island, talks about the earthquakes out at, um, at Bishop's Court area. And there are records of Bishop's Court itself and of um, the church at Braddon, Old Kirk Braddon Church, being, both being damaged um, by earthquakes. 
So they must have been rel- relatively severe, you yeah. would think. Well, absolutely, because I must admit, I certainly can remember one or two in my <laughs> brief lifespan, and um, one certainly enough to sort of rattle the cupboard doors in my bedroom, but that was pretty much it, and it only lasted a few seconds one morning. But uh, when you're talking about structural damage as they, as they were, and, and mm. maybe a, a home actually being ruined, you're, you're talking about something with considerable more strength than one of them. Yes, that, that one that you remember, uh, I remember. Uh, we thought the dog had got loose in the attic or something. We <laughs> weren't quite sure what it was. <laughs> no, exactly. Well, you, don't, you don't expect it on the other man, do you? <laughs> no. Uh, interestingly, too, though, um, Maria Graham, as she was then, when she was out in, um, in Chile, uh, wrote what really must be one of the best accounts of, of an earthquake. She was in a very severe one there lots of buildings destroyed and she um, describes exactly how the earth is moving and she also describes going back into the house afterwards and how all the furniture had been rearranged in this is in part of the building which hadn't been demolished but it had all been shaken so that it was all now orientated on the specific bearing and she got her compass and measured <laughs> where it was and a quick wander a bit further down, a little bit quieter down here because we've just come off the road a little bit into one of the, well, into one of the new parking areas which have been constructed in recent years. Yeah, constructed over the, uh, the top of the river, in fact. So creating, in a sense, a new bridge, but a rather long one, and not for traffic, but for, for getting cars off the road. But... Um, in a sense, interestingly enough, it, it's more or less where there was a bridge across the harbour. The original bridge uh, over the, the river had been further up than the, the present um, stone bridge, as it's often referred to, um, much nearer to the, to the nunnery. And that had been replaced by the stone bridge, um, which in itself was replaced in the 1930s. Um, and now, of course, it's had a lot more work done to it. But in the intervening period, in the 1700s, there was a move when they were going to replace the bridge and they decided to put it much further down the harbour and, in fact, more or less in line with what was then the main road coming into the town. And that road is still marked by the lane at the back of Ridgeway Street, the inland side of Ridgeway Street, running right on up through what used to be uh, Police Station Hill and, and on up Westmoreland Road right the way through. So that was the main route and, and the bridge came more or less straight across the harbour at that point. And it was the construction of that bridge which led to the development of the inner part of the sort of South Quay area from there inland. It was all part of the nunnery estate and at that particular point in time was, was Haywood land, later sold to the Torpmans. So um, that was all part and parcel of, of that development. You forget how extensive the Nunnery estate <coughs> was actually, wasn't it? It was a fair old, fair old size. Well, it took in the whole of Douglas Head, all of the, the area up there, and of course the area in front of Manx Radio that's, that's now the open land, that was a gift to the town from um, the Torpmans when, when they held the estate. But of course there are other interesting things here too, because we cross the road from, uh, from the gas works. And Douglas was relatively early in having town gas, you know, back in the, the middle 1830s, 1835 or so, and it was Mr Gelling of Gelling's Foundry that uh, set up a gas works and he had his shop in the town lit by gas and that was the first use of gas in that way in well on the island and it said that it was good advert everybody used to come and peer at these lit windows <laughs> with the gas so he used part of, of the land where the foundry was because again this is where Gelling's foundry was um, and that was still operating 
uh, when I was working, certainly into the 70s, um, still casting manhole covers and the likes. And they had cast the pieces for the, the rim, for instance, of the Laxey Wheel. They'd cast some of the church bells on the island. And most of the very fancy um, iron railings that you see in gates around the Douglas area particularly, they're part of their castings. And you still see it on the occasional uh, manual cover oh, as well, yes, don't you? Oh yes, the name is there, yes, yes. The unfortunate thing was that when it all packed up, that the wealth of um, patterns that were there in the uh, mould loft just went. They, they just virtually over one weekend disappeared either onto the scrap heap or the, the wooden ones, and of course most of them were actually wood, uh, were just burned. Some were rescued, fortunately, but not, not many. And uh, yes, another piece of history disappears forever. Well, this is what happens, unfortunately. Uh, I think that partly that people don't think that the, there is any merit in them, and partly that things like that happen in a time frame which doesn't allow people to make the inquiries that perhaps ought to be made or for interested parties to be able to do anything about it. into the middle, right by Douglas Bay Yacht Club where they have their uh, rather splendid veranda outside the building and standing next to, well, what are these called, we call them stanchions or I don't know? No, 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 these are, are um, the re last remaining few of, of uh, what used to be all the way around the harbour. These are, are rubbing strakes, um, vertical strakes which were used to hold the, the ships off the the quayside. Um, if you think particularly of, of a thing like a paddle boat with its projecting paddle box in alongside the, the harbour at high tide, and the box is hanging over the, the edge and tide goes out and that sits down and catches on the edge and if nothing is done quickly enough about it, it will just flip the, the boat. And the same could happen with all sorts of other boats. I mean, even the more recent um, Manx boats had a, a rubbing strake down the side. And at very high tides, that could lift up over the edge. And again, if it caught, it, it would have a very bad effect on the boat. So you had these, these vertical strakes to, uh, to hold them off to ensure that didn't happen. But these now are the last remaining few. Last few, few ones. Yeah, yeah, and there's one, one, two, three, four, only about four or five of them, aren't mm. there, left? Well, the town has changed out of all recognition, really. And we were saying about the triangle, and, and in a sense that the town was a triangle, and it was bounded on this side by the, the harbour, effectively the river, bounded on the other side by the sea, but on the third side it was bounded by the old raised beach um, cliff line. Um, a remnant from the, the last ice age where after the ice age the sea level rose higher than it is now about 10 metres or more higher than it is now and it created a, a cliff line where there was soft material um, at that level then when it dropped again it left a platform below that and it was on the platform that Douglas developed. Ah. Can we get on a bit further down here? <laughs> Looks like we can. Blessedly free of traffic, just for a few moments. Well, we've got across quite safely. Managed to ne negotiate the building works. Very busy it is too, and uh, well, I'm sure it'll look fine when it's finished. And down past Queen Street, I think it is. Yes. Yeah, Queen Street probably is, is one of the very few little bits of early streets that are now surviving. It looks, yet yeah, still, uh, this corner here really looks old. Yeah, just the corner mm. of it, it, it still is, yes. You've got the little building, the recent building on the corner, and of course their warehouse behind, and that in itself is now becoming one of the few 
of the old warehouses that are left, which there were quite a number scattered around. Um, we had the bonded warehouse, the customs bonded house, which is gone, where the, more or less where the downtown police station is now. And on the other side, you had the big Corlett Sons and County one, which went. Um, again, many of those designed in the sort of 1820s, 30 time. Um, by the first of the sort of named local architects, a chap called John Taggart, who uh, was responsible for a, a fair amount of work around the place. And um, he obviously had a, a, a line in building these big warehouses. They did a good job too, really. <laughs> well, they, they lasted <laughs> fairly lasted well. a long time. Yes. Well, this one has a sort of interesting bow in the back wall. <laughs> yes, it does when you look at it, but... It's been standing for a wee while yet, and I dare oh, say it's, yes. it's not going to go anywhere for the next year or two. No, we hope it's, uh, it's going to stay there for a, a bit longer anyway. But um, in coming round the top end of the, of the harbour, of course, we passed the roadways now leading up to uh, Tesco and the like, but because that was the Quiggins timber yard, and... Um, Part of the building structure up there along the sides of the yard were the rope walks where rope was made. It was actually made, pulled yes. out and sort of twisted as it were. Yes, yes. I uh, was interested. I was away just a few weeks ago and um, I saw the last remaining uh, working rope walk in uh, the British Isles, at least I, I think it is the last one, um, down at the, the Royal Docks at Chatham. And it was interesting to see the, the displays of how the rope was made down there. With the big machines, there, the Chatham one was actually the longest um, rope walk anyway, because it made all the ropes for the, for the British Navy, for the, the ships that the people we've been talking about were on. Actually on, yeah. yeah. We tramp on down, back past the uh, British, where they're doing all the works in the Market Hall. Past Market Hill and uh, to the corner of the Clarendon, Harris Lane, where they've been resurfacing the roads and they've, well, they discovered some old cellars while they've been doing this. Yes, they've just resurfaced and I think when they took the old surface off, they found what appeared to be sort of three manholes or whatever underneath and when they investigated, they found that these were in fact filled in cellars. Not totally filled, but near enough. So just what they were is, uh, is anybody's guess, whether they were coal holes, which is what they actually looked like, these sort of forward of the property coal cellars, mm -hmm. or whether they were cellars from other buildings which had been on the site, um, it's a bit uncertain. Unfortunately, with the new tarmac down, you can see no sign we'll, of them we'll never being know. there. <laughs> well, we might, because there's obviously other works going on in the neighbourhood, and there's also, of course, major redevelopment works to go on on the open sites. And um, many of the old buildings of downtown Douglas must have had large cellars under them. And really, the rubble was just tipped into those. So there's no knowing what could surface yet in this area. And we might get a whole new light on the history of downtown Douglas. Oh, how exciting. Well, let's hope so anyway. Fingers crossed. You never know. Right, we'll go to our final uh, final corner where we'll have come pretty much, I was going to say full circle, in this case we'll have come full triangle realistically, and uh, the way we've been uh, walking and talking today, so stroll on past the, uh, the buses and back to from whence we came. <laughs> beavering away on the corner <laughs> it's certainly uh, not been short of atmospherics as we see in the radio trade on this little romp today and here we are as I said back from whence we came back outside the sea terminal again at uh, well the end of as I said the end of the triangle rather than the end of the circle yes yes it's been the triangle and we're out now of course uh, in what originally would have been the sea and uh, I suppose in that sense, aptly enough, because it was the, uh, the old Triangle Arcade that stood on this site immediately before the, uh, the sea terminal. 
a rather distinctive building with its fairly distinctive clock tower. I re have cause to remember it well because um, in the preparation for the building of the sea terminal, uh, one uh, Stan Basnett and myself uh, had to do the survey down here. And as you can Im imagine, it's not the easiest of places to survey with no. traffic, even at that time. So um, we did our survey work in the early hours of the morning. And once the traffic started to build up for the nine o'clock boat, we packed up and went home, <laughs> had breakfast and then went back to work <laughs> and draw up what we'd done. So, um, no, I have... Uh, fond memories of this area and and of the construction of, of the sea terminal building itself. I was going to say the actual, uh, I always call it lemon squeezer which indeed what it is but uh, the current inhabitant of this site, uh, is it a good, good inhabitant for you? Well it got christened uh, the lemon squeezer early on because um, it's altered considerably even in itself over the years. Um, within the, the big waiting hall of course we've had all the bits chopped off for the officers but I think what most people perhaps don't realise now is that when it was first constructed it was virtually totally empty inside all of the wings they were all public um, access walkways from one end to the other all of the the ground floor where the tourist department is where the, the ports authority are and, and indeed all of the upstairs areas as well and you could go up and you could walk through and you could walk out onto the roof of the shelters and right down opposite the boat to see it off and of course the lemon squeeze a bit itself and again it's been filled partially filled in under it um, that was a uh, one of the best restaurants in town but it just I think perhaps makes the point, doesn't it, uh, as to how much things alter around us, even in the relatively short time that that building has been up. It's gone through a whole series of changes, and those changes are always going on around us. We don't always notice them. Sometimes when we stop and look and think, then perhaps they become more apparent. Absolutely, very true indeed, and I think uh, on those sage words, I want to say thanks very much indeed to Frank Cowan for uh, sharing his time with us today to have a walk around the Golden Triangle, round right in the heart of Douglas, and the most enjoyable and informative, if I can say that, informative it's been as well. Not a drop of rain. So thanks very much. We shall see you, of course, same time, same place next week. But uh, for now, from Frank and myself, it's cheerio. Cheerio.